Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, I'm going to be answering a question that I actually got from one of you guys, and that is, what is that tube that is protruding from the backside of the jet engines on the 737? And why does it sometimes come smoke out of it? That and the oil system and many other things is going to be on today's episode, so stay tuned. All right, guys, so this is a video that I never thought that I would do, and it is a video straight from you guys. I was reading through the comments um, on one of my other videos, I can't remember which one it was, but anyway, someone told me. You know, I've been flying on different aircraft types, uh, I've been looking at the jet engines, and I've noticed this tube that's producing at the back of the 737 jet engines. What is it and why does it smoke so much? And, and I looked at that question and I thought, <laughs> um, hmm. and I actually went like that because I first thought that I knew what it was. And then I realized that I am not sure that is actually what it is. And then I started looking into it. And I find the most fascinating system that I had no idea actually existed. Now you might think, what do you mean he had no idea it existed? He's a Boeing 737 training captain and a type rating examiner. Shouldn't he know every single system? But the fact is that the, the level of technical knowledge that you get as a pilot is a fairly kind of superficial one. Since we are taught the technical systems to a level where we understand them and we understand how they interact with each other but we don't go into kind of an engineering level on each and every one of these systems and in order to find out something like this that's what I had to do I had to go in and I had to dive into different forums on the internet and to check the technical manuals and to engineering manuals to find the answer to it you would think that it would be fairly straightforward but not so much so, in order to understand this, we first have to have a look at how the jet engine works. Um, a jet engine comprises of several parts. The first part that you will see is the big fan in the front. Now, the big fan is essentially a propeller. The only thing it really does is it pushes the air backwards and it produces a majority of the thrust that the engine produces. Behind the jet engine, you have the different compressor stages. Now, there are different amount of compressor stages, depending on what kind of a jet engine it is. But what they all have in common is that they compress the air that it sucks in and it heats it up and it pushes it towards the combustion chamber. In the combustion chamber, when the air has passed all of these compressor stages, and by the way, it's in the compressor stages that we take bleed air out of the engine in order to feed the pressurization of the aircraft, the pressurization of the oil tanks and the, uh, the seals, which we will talk about in a second, and systems like this. So behind the compressor stages, the air then enters into the combustion chamber where fuel is added and we light it on fire and the air then becomes much hotter, expands, increases in speed and it's pushed backwards. Now from this stage it passes through the turbine stages and the turbine stages harnesses some of that energy and uses that to drive the compressor. Anyway, one of the major benefits of running jet engines is that they have very few moving parts. If you compare it to a normal combustion uh, engine that you have on a car, for example, that will have a lot of pistons, for example, that is accelerated and decelerated, and you'll have a lot of different moving parts. Anytime you have accelerations and decelerations, there's always a chance of breakage and fatigue building. But in the case of a jet engine, most of the moving parts are actually rotating parts. But this rotating part still needs to be supported and they still need to be lubricated. Now, in the case of the CFM 56, which is the jet engine on the 737, there are five different bearings inside of the jet engine. We have three of them uh, that is housed in the forward part of the jet engine in the, uh, in the fan cowling. And then you have two in the turbine frame in the back of the jet engine. 
So these bearings need to be constantly lubricated because it's an enormous amount of energy that goes through them, a lot of circular movement. Um, and that is done in a system called a dry sump system, which we'll get to in a second. But this brings us into the oil system of the 737, which is another one of these amazingly complicated systems. You think it is easy. I, like a pilot who reads the technical manual, think that it's fairly easy. But then you start looking into it and you realize what geniuses they were, the ones who actually constructed the system. But in an overview, um, it starts with the oil tank. In the oil tank, we see what kind of oil quantity we have that is being fed up to our um, displays so that we can monitor the amount of oil that we have. Um, and then it is being fed out through the supply lines to a oil pump. The oil pump will then pressurize the oil and feed it to wherever it's needed. So either one of these five bearings or into something like the accessory gearbox, for example. Basically, any part of the engine that needs lubrication, cleaning, sometimes cooling, uh, the oil system takes care of that. It's like the blood ve veins of the, the body, but in the engine. Once the pressurized oil has done its job and it has lubricated and cleaned the components, the oil then gets scavenged out of the dry sump and it gets sucked through a couple of magnetic detectors these magnetic detectors are there to pick up any metal shavings or anything that comes from inside of the engine. And if you remember the video that I did last week about the Atlantic glider, um, remember that the original engine that was fitted to that aircraft was actually removed because the engineers had found metal shavings inside of the engine. If they do that, it is an indication that some part inside of the engine is starting to deteriorate. And as with anything in aviation, we're always safety before everything else. So in that case, they took the engine away to, to check it out. And that's why we have these metallic traps. The oil then goes through the scavenge pumps and then it gets pushed through another filter and then through the oil cooler. In order to cool the oil, we're using fuel. Fuel is generally really cold because the fuel is sitting in the wing tanks or in the center tank. Uh, it can go down to as cold as minus 25, minus 30 degrees sometimes. Uh, and the fuel gets pushed back past the oil in, an oil, in a uh, heat exchanger. And that's how we cool down the oil. Once again, remember this from last week's video? Yes, this is how it works. Once that's done, then the oil is returned back into the... Um, the oil reservoir, the oil tank, and the whole thing starts again. But what about the tube in the back? When are you ever going to get to the tube in the back? Well, here is where this system becomes interesting. So, we talked about this being a dry sump system. This means that this whole cycle uh, is completely isolated, right? There is no what we call a wet sump where a component would be going through oil at the bottom of a sump. Now in this case you have kind of a, a wet chamber which contains the oil and outside that you have a couple of set of seals with a dry chamber outside and that dry chamber is pressurized with air. Okay so you have high pressure outside, a lot of air being pushed up against these seals and that seals it, makes sure that the oil doesn't come out and hits other components. If it does, that could cause an engine fire and we definitely don't want that. So when you have a lot of pressure outside and you have a seal, well then some of that pressure is going to go inside. Now here is where this system starts to become really interesting. So as this uh, high pressurized air is entering into the oil inside of this dry sump system, it creates kind of a oil mist in there, which is fine. It works well when it comes to lubricating the parts, cleaning the parts and so on. However, when the oil is then being scavenged out, it is kind of like a foam, okay? And that's not what we want to be pushed back into the oil tank. So it now goes through a two-stage system to remove the air from the oil. The first thing that it goes through is something called an, a de-aerator. 
and essentially that's just bringing all of this foam into a, um, a component that churns it and then as it's churning it that by itself is kind of separating some of the oil towards the bottom where it's being scavenged out and some of the air up to the top where the air is being sucked out. However, that air that's being sucked out still carries quite a lot of oil. So that air that is being sucked out of the top is now going to a second component called a centrifugal breather. And what that is essentially is a centrifugal with tiny little holes in it. So as the air enters into this and starts rotating, the heavier oil components is being pressed out and then through those little holes, it's then run down and scavenged back into the oil system while the air continues flowing through the, uh, the breather and then out through a breather tube. You with me so far? Cool. Now in most jet engines, this centrifugal breather is connected to the accessory gearbox, generally at the bottom of the, uh, the jet engine. So you might have seen this on, on other um, jet engines or aircraft that are taxiing in, that sometimes you can see a little bit of puffs of smoke coming out of the bottom part of the jet engine. That's the oil breather tube that is coming out from the accessory gearbox. But in the case of the 737 and on the CFM 56 jet engine, they are using the hollow N1 shaft as a centrifugal breather. So this means that the central part of the engine, the shaft that's running up towards the fan and towards you know, what we see as N1 on our engine instrumentations, that part is being used as this breather system. And that means that the air that is now being rid of the remaining oil is being pushed out towards the very center back of the engine. And that's what you see. What you're seeing is a breather tube, an oil breather tube. And the reason that you can see some smoke coming out of it now and then is because no matter how quickly this um, central part, this, this N1 shaft is rotating, there will still be a little bit of oil that comes out. And obviously it's coming out through the hot part of the engine is being heated up and you see it as smoke coming out of the breather tube at the back of the engine. This is actually one of the main um, kind of reasons that we lose oil in a jet engine. The jet engine, the CFM56, loses about half a liter of oil per hour flown, more or less, at least that's the, the figures that I've found. Um, don't hang me on those. And that's why we have to, on regular intervals, almost every night when the aircraft is at the night stop, we have to, um, to refill a couple of quarts of oil into the jet engine. The minimum amount of uh, oil that we are allowed to carry is 12 quarts of oil or 12 liters of oil. <laughs> um, it's actually recently been changed. I believe now it's 12 liters rather than 12 quarts. We still have a huge problems with different units, which by the way is the subject of an upcoming video. So make sure that you stay tuned for that one when it comes. But this guys, this is the reason I love doing this channel. Because if it weren't for you, if it weren't for the person who asked this question, I would never have looked this deeply into the oil system and found out the breather system and how it works and why that you know tube is actually there at the back. So a huge thank you to all of you who keep sending in questions here. I hope if you've been watching this far that I have earned a subscription. If you want these kind of videos and these kind of explanations, then make sure that you subscribe to the video, that you highlight the little notification bell, because if you don't, you won't see when I do, for example, live streams or when I do spontaneous new videos, when I'm out on the line or whatever it might be. So make sure you, you have subscribed. And that's it, guys. I want to finish up with a huge thank you to my Patreon crew. My Patreon crew are there to help me, support me and give, you know, these kind of ideas to me. I've been running different videos past them and they have been getting to vote on which videos they think I should be doing next and I listen a lot to my Patreon crew because they are providing not only financial stability to the channel but also a lot of quality kind of control to make sure that what I'm sending out is the best possible videos for you guys and if you want to join then there's going to be a link up here you can join at any level 
any support is highly appreciated. But if you go over the $10 or 10 euros per month level, you will also get a premium um, membership inside of the Mentor Aviation app and many other cool perks. So go and check it out today. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.